As a woman described in Leviticus as unclean, mm -hmm. she's not allowed to touch anyone if she makes them unclean. As a woman, she's not allowed to touch a man. And yet she made her way through that crowd. Mm. And as far as she would have understood by Jewish law, touching Jesus would have made him unclean. And he's supposed to be going to heal Jairus' daughter. Mm. She didn't understand that when we touch Jesus, we don't make him unclean. Mm. It's when he touches us that we are made clean. One of the places I've wanted to visit for gosh, so many years is, is Magdala, the place where we believe that Mary Magdalene was born and where she grew up. And I think it's just going to be a beautiful place to be there. And I read an article that said they have excavated a synagogue that they believe would go right back to the time of Jesus. So the thought that we could stand on the very stones where perhaps Christ himself stood is just it's so exciting. And not only that, I don't know if it's a painting or a mural. I stopped looking before I saw what it was because a friend had said to me, who had been to Israel before, she said, don't prepare yourself. She said, you just walk into that room and you feel the presence of Christ. So that's what I'm really excited about today. Rania. Oh. What an honor to meet you. You too, Sheila. What a blessing. What a blessing. Thank, Thank you, you so coming. much for meeting me here in Aww. Magdala. Let's walk a Aww. little. Thank you for coming. It's an honor. I was born in Scotland. Mm -hmm. So if you were to ask me, what do you like about Scotland? I could tell you mm -hmm. 10 things. Having been born in this land, what do you love? about Israel? There is an endless answer to this, but <laughs> Nazareth is my home. So even thinking about it, I'm stepping on the place where my Jesus has stepped on every day, remembering what he has spoken because these words are still alive in the atmosphere, if you think about it. Yeah. Every day is for us an incredible privilege, I believe, to be in this land because yeah. this is where his steps will step again as he returns for his bride. Were you brought up in, in a Christian family? So we are from a Greek, back, a Greek Orthodox background. So I was born into the kingdom when I was 16 years old. I met Jesus in Nazareth. Wow. Because <laughs> I was longing for him as a young lady. Amazing. This is obviously an excavation, a discovery. What is this? which actually we're seeing here um, and, and ruins of a town. And this town is called Magdala. It's the town of Mary the Magdalene. The word in Hebrew means Migdal. Migdal means tower. And in fact, in the ancient history, they think or they called it the Tower of Fish because of its industry. Oh, because we're so right by the Sea of Galilee. We're right by the Sea of Galilee. It's the northern you know, part of the Tiberias town. Yes. And here, this beside the port, it, there was a port there, it was an industry exporting salted fish. I had no idea what to expect, but when I walked in here today, I felt the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. I've gone sightseeing in countries all over the world. Yes. This is different. You know, it's not just the history. Mm -hmm. His presence is still here, is hovering over this area, over this place, and everyone who comes into the land can experience the same thing. We're going to be inviting some of our friends to come with us on another trip mm -hmm. later this year because you can't describe in words yes. what it's like. You have to actually experience. Over here, I think we're going to be able to go and actually mm -hmm. look at what would have been a synagogue. Yes. Do you know what I was surprised by? It's actually quite small. So small, isn't it? And is that typical? Very small number of people used to come every Saturday there yeah. to pray. They had intimacy. Yeah. Yes, they had personal relationship. Yeah. They saw each other faces. <laughs> they recognized each other because they right. met every Saturday there. Right. This is the beauty of what we have in the Middle East. Let me call it this way. One of the things that we hear a lot about on the news is the tension that exists within Israel. Mm -hmm. Um, whether it's between Jew and Arab or, you know, different factions within the land. Mm -hmm. What do you see 
Jesus doing in that kind of world to bring, particularly to bring women together. The Lord has allowed me by His grace to really dream with Him about the unity of the family. I love that. There will be no awakening unless the family is regathered together. So women carry a very powerful role in regathering the family together. Mm -hmm. As an Arab, you know, speaking, loving my Jewish family, welcoming them onto in my table, and them welcoming me on the table for them. Mm -hmm. That is a key for us to see Israel restored and an awakening coming to this land. We're beginning to see in America pockets of revival. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, it's beginning with young people. Amen. That to hear that that is happening here is, is powerful. I think it's incredible. These ruins of the synagogue have lasted, I mean, over 2,000 years. More than 2,000 years for sure, at least we're talking. Lots of people come. It's a very popular place to come, but we have been given permission to actually walk through these, through this door and, and sit inside. What a privilege. What a privilege. You know, being here um, in Magdala, obviously, I'm thinking of Mary Magdalene. Yes. I've always thought it was so amazing that Christ, when he rose from the dead, the very first person he showed himself to was Mary. The one who'd been filled with so much darkness was the one to see that darkness had been conquered oh, forever man. and ever. Not only that, she would be the first to be sent out carrying the great news about the resurrected Messiah. She was the first apostle. <laughs> first <laughs> missionary into the, into the world too, which is just, it's absolutely amazing. Okay, so if you can, take us back over 2,000 years ago. And this is not a ruin. This is a synagogue. During the week, the village, Magdala, is busy. What happens on Sabbath? In the synagogue, of course, People are here every Saturday, reading the Torah, declaring, praying, communing together. So this is really a very, a place that is so alive during the Saturdays and during the week. And the Torah and the words of the Lord were declared here from this place, out to the whole village, of course, here in the Magdala area. So this is an incredible place to be able to witness and see that all what the Lord spoke about biblically there is proofs also archaeologically and historically yeah. to what's taking place. This um, stone over there, yeah. is that where the scriptures would be opened? It looks like it was excavated before the destruction of the temple uh, in 70 BC. I'm thinking of it's yes. Sabbath, like one before and one before, and suddenly Jesus begins to read from Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He has anointed me. Can you imagine what that moment would have been like for those who were there that day? That is incredible uh, because, you know, coming from Nazareth also. Yeah. And uh, I love the synagogue church. This is actually a place of encounter for me. And I call it the womb of Nazareth. It's the place of birthing. This is the place where the commission was released. It gives me chills. The other story that we're going to touch on later is we read about it in Mark's gospel, Mark chapter five, the woman with the issue of blood. And I believe we're going to go see something that I've never seen before. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, when you first saw it, how did that impact you? This impacted me very strongly because it's like really the same story comes alive back again. You know, and the Lord himself is the same resurrected Messiah who met Mary the Magdalene. He's now, yesterday, today, and forever. The same God who did this miracle is able and willing to do the same miracle. There is hope for every woman. In this specific mural, when I look at it, I say this is a great message of hope. Honestly, I get the sense that we're living in a new day, that the things that we have taken for granted, the miracles that Jesus did, the, the living in His presence, I, I feel like the Lord is moving and I feel that here and I feel that at home. So why don't you and I go take that little journey and let's go see that 
prophetic painting for ourselves. Oh, I can't wait, Sheila. Let's do Thank that. Thank you. Thank you. You know what's amazing to me, seeing this church here? It's like right by the Sea of Galilee. Yes. How beautiful is that? So is this a fairly recent addition? Yes, this, church? this, is, this is very recent, yeah. It just says everything. Yeah. The faith that it must have taken for that woman mm -hmm. to reach out thinking, if I can just mm -hmm. touch the edge of his robe. I was reading the story this morning before we came. Yes. And Jesus was on his way with a very influential man with Jairus. Mm. But when she reached out in faith and touched him, yes, he stopped. Wow, the presence of God is so, so thick here in this uh, chapel. I, I can feel that. Mm. Can you imagine what it must have been like that day? I mean, she, as a woman described in Leviticus, is unclean. Mm. She's not allowed to touch anyone if she makes them unclean. As a woman, she's not allowed to touch a man. And yet she made her way through that crowd. Mm. And as far as she would have understood by Jewish law, Touching Jesus would have made him unclean, and he's supposed to be going to heal Jairus' daughter. Mm. She didn't understand that when we touch Jesus, we don't make him unclean. Mm. It's when he touches us that we are made clean. Hallelujah. Why would she touch the hem of his garment? I wondered about that, and as I more researched, I found out that the Lord commanded the sons of Israel to make corners or we'll say tussles for their borders, for their clothes. Uh, and that's a reminder of who they are as a, a holy priesthood for him. This is their, their identity, their uh, commitment to him. Yeah. And so her thinking, if that was really the Messiah, and if that is the, the, the God that I am supposed to receive healing from, mm -hmm. he says he's a Messiah. She actually remembered what the rabbis told her about the hymn which is referenced in Malachi 4.2. And it says, those who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will arise and healing in its wings. Wow. The word wings, it's the same word, kanaf in Hebrew, the same as was written with the hem in that specific verse. Oh my gosh. In Numbers 15.38. Wow. So she thought then, if that was the Messiah, if this is what he says, he, who he is, I know the Son of Righteousness, Him, arise. will arise and I will receive my healing. You know what else I love about the story? I love that the disciples just didn't get it. You know, when Jesus said, who touched me? And they were like, Lord, look at the crowd. Yeah. But He knew the difference between somebody bumping into Him yes. and somebody reaching out and touching Him in faith. And that's mm. why He stopped. This is incredible to me that the persevering faith that she had, mm. despite the social, religious rejection. For 12 years, that's a long, long time. Long time. And she had nothing to lose. People say that she was hopeless. I don't think she was hopeless. She had a lot of, I mean, she had hope inside of her. She knew mm. that this was my last chance to live. Yeah. And so that desperate faith has met his grace and the miracle took place. I love that. That is going to be my prayer from now on, that I would be so desperate for Jesus. Yes. So desperate and reach mm. out in faith. Mm. And that's when miracles happen. That's when miracles happen. And that's my cry and prayer for every woman yeah. Yeah. that's listening to us. I will never, never forget this day. Thank mm. you for sharing it with me. Thank you so much, Sheila. Amazing. It's a great honor. So I have to tell you, friends, this is something that's been on my spiritual bucket list for many, many years. One of my favorite stories in scripture 
is going to come to life here because I'm sitting at the edge of the Sea of Galilee in Magdala, where Mary of Mary Magdalene, Mary of Magdala, um, was born and raised, and Capernaum is just a few miles to the north. So it's exactly where the story happened. And I don't know about you, but sometimes we read stories and we think, well, what does that have to say to me living today with the issues that I have today? I've, I've loved it since I was a child, but it's one of those stories that the more I read it, um, the more understanding the Holy Spirit brings, and the more I understand what it's got to say to you and to me today. So first of all, let me read it to you. And I'm reading from, as you can tell, it's a favorite because it's starting to fall out of my Bible, but it's from Mark's Gospel. And it's from Mark chapter five. And I'm reading from verse 21 in the New Living Translation. So this is what it says. Jesus got into the boat again. I mean, can you just imagine, you know, he's on the other side and he gets into the boat and he comes this way and went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Even that shows, shows the humility of Jairus. He's a very respected man. He's probably the leader of the synagogue in that town. But he is so desperate for Jesus that when he sees Jesus, this man falls to his feet and begs Jesus to come. And I'm sure he was thinking, will he come? Can he save her? What will he do? And I'm wondering how many times you've been in a situation like that, where you're desperate and you're asking Jesus, please come. Will he come? Well, let's read on to see what Jesus did. Jesus went with him and all the people followed, crowding around him. And then we meet this woman, a woman in the crowd. She's not even given a name. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors and over the years, she'd spent everything she had to pay them, but she'd gotten no better. In fact, she'd gotten worse. In the Talmud, they had all sorts of remedies for her condition. And some of them sound medicinal, but some of them to us sound ridiculous. One of them was if she carried around the ashes of an ostrich's egg in a piece of cloth with her, then perhaps she would be healed. Well, sometimes, you know, sometimes you're so desperate, you'll try anything. And she had tried everything. And now she had no money and she was no better. She had heard about Jesus. So she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately, immediately the bleeding stopped. And she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? It took a lot of courage for her to do what she did because by Levitical law, you know, we're familiar with the 10 commandments, but if you were a devout Jew living in those days, do you know that you had to follow 624 rules, all laid out in Leviticus? 365 things, I believe, that you had to do and 244, I think, things that you must not do. And interestingly enough, 365, that's the number of days in a year. 244, that's the number of bones in a human body. So if you were a devout Jew living here on the edge of the Sea of Galilee, you woke up every morning knowing with every bone in your body, every day of your life, you have all these rules to keep. Well, she has just broken them. She has not only touched a man, which would be against the law, she has touched a man when she is ceremonially unclean, but she's so desperate. I just wonder, have you ever been there where people can tell you, well, don't do this and don't do that and don't pray too loudly and don't go there and don't do that, but you're so desperate for a touch from Jesus 
that you just ignore them all and reach out. Well, Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept looking around to see what, who had done it. Then the frightened woman trembling at the realization of what she had done, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace, your suffering is over. The, the disciples, they don't get it at all. They're like, Lord, what do you mean? Everybody's touching you. Look at the size of this crowd. It's like, you know, it's like the day after Thanksgiving. It's like Black Friday. But Jesus knows the difference between those who casually bump into him in a crowd, in a church, in a conference, in a meeting, and those who reach out and touch him in faith. And so even though Jairus, this respected man, is waiting desperately, Jesus stops and says, who touched me? Now she has two choices. She can either admit what she's done, but as far as she understands, she could be arrested. What she did was she broke the law in a very serious way. And to her understanding of scripture, because she touched Jesus, she has now made him unclean and he can't go and heal this man's daughter. She didn't understand that the king was here and everything had changed. All the rules had changed. Christ in himself fulfilled every one of the laws. If she'd gone home, because she could, she knows she's healed now, she could slip home and 10 days later, she could come and bring a, a small offering to the priest, pigeon or young dove, and the priest could declare her ceremonially clean and she could go on with life. See, the thing is, she wanted the bleeding to stop. Jesus wanted more. He wanted to make her whole. So what she did, and scripture makes it very clear, she was terrified. She came forward and she fell at Jesus' feet. But here's the part I want you to hear. She told him the whole truth. Now, if you think about it, she's been out of community for 12 years. She has a lot to say. And Jesus waited and listened. But I want, what I wanna ask you is, have you ever done that? Have you ever told Jesus the whole truth? You know, so often I think I've wanted an answer to a certain prayer, but what I've discovered is what I actually long for is the presence of the Lord. And the most amazing thing happens, even though she's identified as a woman in the crowd, Jesus publicly in front of that whole crowd owns her. He says to her, daughter. Do you know that's the only time in the whole canon of the New Testament that Jesus addresses one woman as daughter. He says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Now, could she have gone home without telling Jesus the whole truth? Sure she could. Would she have known the peace of the Lord? I don't think so. I wonder how many of us show up week after week after week at church, but we hold on to all our stuff. We don't tell Jesus the whole truth. The most liberating thing in my life was the day when I finally told Jesus everything about my life. How broken I felt as a child, how worthless, how unlovable I felt. And when you tell Jesus the whole truth, then you've made space for grace and His peace. And that's what I want for you. That's the legacy that this woman has left for you and I. Her courageous faith to fight through that crowd and just touch the edge of his garment, not only made her whole, but sent her home in peace. Can I pray for you? Father God, as I sit here at the edge of the Sea of Galilee, where your son did so much of his ministry, Lord, I think of that one woman who was brave enough to reach out and touch the edge of your robe, Jesus. So I ask that right now for every single person who is watching this or listening to this. 
Lord, would you give us by your grace the ability to fall on our knees before you, to tell you the whole truth, and then to hear you say, daughter, son, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. Hey, I'm Mati Shoshani, and thank you for watching the TBN Israel YouTube channel. We hope this video gave you greater understanding of Israel and her people. If you haven't already, subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you never miss a video. We'd love to hear from you, so be sure to share what you've learned and ask your questions and comments below. And invite your friends to join the conversation.